Hello, everybody, and welcome to Korean Experiential Learning's presentation on interviews. Uh, my name is Mitch, and I'll be walking you through how to navigate professional interviews. I'm going to break down the interviews by the various stages and then go through the different types of questions that may be asked. So let's jump into it. I'll start by reviewing why we interview an applicant. Uh, there's three things employers are looking to know. They want to know, can you do the job? Will you do the job? And will you fit in with the company, the work culture that they have uh, at their location? Uh, to do this, uh, your role is to demonstrate the skills and the knowledge that you have surrounding the position uh, that you're applying for. Um, you have to demonstrate that you're going to want to do the job. And if they hire you, you will be successful in that role. So you've got to demonstrate enthusiasm, motivation, and your personality. Lastly, you've got to create a connection with uh, the individuals in the interview to let them know that um, you're going to fit in with the work culture there. You're going to get along with them and they're going to get along with you. It's important to recognize here that interviews are a two way street. Uh, they want to know if you're going to be a good employee, but you should also be interviewing them uh, to ensure that they're going to be a good employer. Breaking down the interview, we can actually see that there's a lot of different stages. Um, and I'm going to go through how to prepare for the interview, um, what to do when you uh, first get there, uh, to greet the employer, the different types of questions, and what to do after the interview. Your first point of engagement for a potential interview might actually be through a pre-screen, either a phone or an email, just to cover some of the basics, uh, whether you meet the qualifications and the experience, or whether you're still available or you can meet whatever specific availability they may have for the role, whether it's given hours, days, or a contract length. Uh, it's pretty simple here. Just be open and honest with them. Um, but you can start to, uh, to develop that connection by um, being excited that they reached out to you and reiterating your, your interest in their company. Um, be honest though and don't waste their time. Uh, if you know that you're not going to be available for a contract or can't do the hours that they want to, um, tell them up front so that you're not wasting their time or your time. After you're offered the interview, there's really one rule uh, that you should follow that's going to play a big part in whether or not you're successful or not throughout through the actual interview. And that's quite simply, be prepared so you can kill the interview. But um, Being prepared is really the foundation of a successful interview. Uh, most interviews will start with the first question, tell me about yourself. And then the second question is going to be, tell us what you know about our company. Uh, and this is going to determine how well the rest of the interview is going to go. If you fall flat on your face because you didn't go to their website, the rest of the interview is going to go very quickly and very awkwardly. Uh, however, if you have a well-prepared answer for what you know about their company and their services, um, you're going to grab their engagement right off the bat and they're going to stay uh, engaged with you throughout the rest of the interview. You want to do your research as thoroughly as you can. Know your audience, know the company, search for them online, uh, through social media, through business websites like Glassdoor. Uh, if you know anybody who works at the company, reach out to them and ask them. Some employers are even okay with you reaching out to the interviewers themselves uh, and asking them some preparation questions. You should especially know the job posting thoroughly, how the role fits into the company, what the day-to-day -day expectations of it are. Uh, many of the interview questions are likely going to be derived from the job posting. The better you can understand what's going to be asked of you, uh, the better you can actually understand what will literally be asked of you in the interview. There's always a range of what you can wear to the interview. Uh, it's going to be your job to determine what the work culture is at the company you're applying for and how you can match uh, that level. Typically, whatever they'll wear day to day, to day you'll up one or two degrees for the more formal interview aspect. 
For guys, it's pretty straightforward in that most men will wear a nice pair of pants and then a button-up shirt, uh, possibly throw on a jacket or a tie over top of that. What's important to keep in mind is just how your formal clothes fit. Uh, a good fit for a shirt or a blazer jacket is going to be the seam to be right at the edge of your shoulder, uh, not too short, not too long. Uh, and then the seat of your pants, you want to make sure that they fit you properly and there's no kind of excessive bunching or that your pants aren't too tight. It's always good to have a friend check out how well your formal clothes fit. In preparing for the interview, you're going to bring uh, copies of your resume, one for yourself and one for each of the interviewers that are going to be present. Uh, you're also going to be bringing a list of your references and then it's up to you if you want to bring a portfolio or notes. Um, sometimes this is optional, sometimes it's job dependent. Uh, teachers are a profession or uh, marketing professionals are another profession that are more likely to bring a portfolio to demonstrate examples of their work. You also want to have a prepared list of questions to ask the interviews interviewers at the end, and we'll cover that later on. So arrival, you've done your preparation and you're arriving at the location. The interview begins when you arrive on the premises. Most offices have windows and those windows can look out into the parking lots. So just be aware that you might be uh, in eyesight uh, as soon as you approach the building. Uh, so anyone that may be kind of tucking their shirt into their pants or putting on their makeup in the rear view of their car, um, they may be watching you do that. So just FYI, be prepared as soon as you arrive to make that good first impression. Make sure you get the exact time and location of the interview and you do research so that you can prepare to, prepare to be there 10 minutes early. Uh, if you show up late for the interview, that cast doubt on any time management, reliability, or planning that you might have advertised on your resume. Uh, so short of any extenuating circumstances, it'll cast a bad light right at the start of the interview and will likely cause the interviewer to doubt some of the other skills that you have on your resume as well. While you wait, it's important to be friendly, polite, and curious to everybody around, especially the front desk or reception area, where good interviewers will often ask um, what they thought of the candidate as well. So everybody that you meet will likely have a say in, uh, in how well you're going to perform. You should wait calmly, uh, quietly, and patiently. Try not to disrupt anybody. Um, it's okay to be on your phone, maybe research, do a little bit more of that research while you're there, um, but try not to interview with anybody, interfere with anybody that's trying to do their work. The opening is your first impression to meeting the employer. And I take the moral from Goldilocks and the Three Bears for this one not the home invasion part, the finding a balance piece. While Goldilocks was looking for just the right fit for food and a place to sleep, we're looking at that balance profile when it comes to body language. Uh, and the elements I'm gonna be looking at specifically are eye contact, smiling, uh, body position or posture, uh, and the handshake. When it comes to body language, we want to find a balanced approach to these four things. When it comes to eye contact, we don't want to be too timid, timid and not have any eye contact. We also don't want to be overconfident and lock eyes or stare at them. Instead, we want this nice balanced view where we're maintaining eye contact for a few seconds and then we look away for a second or two before engaging them again in eye contact. When smiling, again, we don't want to come across too timid or too anxious and not smile at all. Um, we also don't want to appear fake or like we're trying too hard uh, and, and grin just a little too much with our teeth. Instead, we want to find that practiced, genuine and comfortable smile uh, that puts people at ease. And it's really important to smile because smiling at people actually tricks them into liking us. We like people who like us. For posture, uh, too timid is things such as hunched shoulders, bowed head, or slouching, uh, whereas overconfident can be something like peacocking or manspreading. Uh, balanced posture, 
uh, for for North American culture is going to be heads up, shoulders black, shoulders back, uh, but not too far back. The handshake is a lot more fun to do in class, but I'll still go over it. Handshaking is really important in the North American culture as the way we shake hands uh, gives a certain impression about who we are and how we handle ourselves. And there's a couple ways that this can go wrong. Uh, a couple of the, the sillier handshakes that I like to go over are one, the vice grip. That's where we really go in and try to crush somebody's hand. It's, uh, we get into a bit of a power struggle with them and we're trying to show dominance. Second one, more for fun, is the bro shake where it's really casual uh, and we would never use this in a work environment, um, but we might with our friends. One that would likely be done in a work environment is the two-hander, where we go in and we put a second hand on top of their, their hand or even on their elbow. Um, much like the bro shake, this actually shows a little bit too much uh, familiarity or casualness um, or a sense of over-eagerness. So we want to stay away from this one too. Uh, and the last one we'll call the limp fish. That's where we're really not shaking a hand. We're giving our hand for the other person to shake. Uh, this one is really awkward and doesn't really feel good at all. Um, also implies kind of a weird power dynamic, either entitlement or submission. What we want to do is a nice, firm, balanced handshake where we go in hand to hand where they meet at the webbing and you shake once or twice and then release. And that's it. I really recommend everybody get a chance to practice handshakes with a couple different friends uh, and get them to give feedback on how your handshake is. So while handshakes are pretty important, typically our current climate doesn't really allow for them. Most of us have been um, resigned to our homes and many of us are now doing virtual interviews, uh, which means there's some different accommodations that we need to look at. Uh, first, obviously we have less body language to use uh, and we won't be doing the handshake, um, which means that there's an increased importance on eye contact, facial expressions and voice affect affect meaning the natural highs and lows that our our tone uh, does so tip here is to position your camera at eye level nobody wants your camera right on a table looking up your nose um, and far enough back to capture your hand movements especially if you're a hand talker this can add that personality enthusiasm and excitement uh, to to make sure the employer knows that you're excited to be there uh, a couple um, downsides to virtual interviews. Uh, sometimes the technology can take some getting used to. Make sure that the interview isn't the first time that you're logging on to that technology. Always get in there beforehand to test or practice it uh, so that you're familiar with it in the interview. Second, the natural flow and rhythm of conversations is disrupted. Um, sometimes we're talking over each other or we're not sure if the other person's done talking. It requires a lot more um, kind of check-ins and a uh, little bit more back and forth, which can take some getting used to. Uh, last here is the increased visual information. This is especially for panel interviews where you might have three to five people on the video call and so you're looking at each of their faces at the same time. This extra information can be distracting and can make it harder to read the room. However, there are some advantages as well. Um, one, notes. You can put notes on your computer. You can tape them beside your computer, put on them on the wall behind you. Um, while you shouldn't be overly relying on your notes, they are great to reference every now and then, especially for technical interviews or technical questions. This can be really helpful. Second, you're in a more familiar space. Um, oftentimes this can reduce anxiety when you're, you're having an interview from the, the comfort of your, uh, your living room or home office, uh, which can be really nice for some people. Lastly, you can record and practice. Um, use some of the video software on your computer to record yourself answering some of those traditional questions that I'll go over soon um, so that you can see exactly how you look. Uh, this is a great way to double check how others are seeing you. This is also good for, for non-virtual interviews as well. Record yourself and practice. Uh, it's important to recognize that you should prepare just as you would in person. So get up, go through your typical routines, get dressed up, um, and, and present yourself the same way you would. 
this helps get us into the same mindset that you would for a in-person interview. So try not to change too much as you prepare for uh, this type of interview. The actual interview could take place in a couple different formats. Uh, it could be one-to-one, -one, uh, it could be panel where you'll have two or three people interviewing you, um, or especially right now, uh, it could be online where you're on the other side of a camera. Your role here is to, if you can, research the speakers so you know who you're going to be speaking to, uh, and then to read the room and engage with everybody. Your job is to make a connection, make a connection, start a conversation, and really get one of your interviewers to be your ally when it comes to who they want to actually nominate for the position. Um, so I'll advise here: you really want to kind of subvert the interview um into a conversation don't feel like you need to hold your questions for the end of the interview if you have them ask them kind of wherever they're naturally you want to create a connection and a relationship uh, with the person on the other side of the table at the end of the day you're applying to be this person's colleague another piece of advice i'll, I'll say here is take your time um, a lot of people get very anxious in interviews so prepare stall statements if you feel you need to. So these are lines that you can use as go-tos, such as, good question, let me think for a moment. Or, hmm, yeah, I uh, hadn't thought of that. Um, an interviewer would always prefer a slow, thoughtful answer uh, than a fast, rushed answer. Um, so prepare stall statements if you think you're going to need them. They can be very helpful. The questions in the interview can be divided into four different categories that I'll go over uh, one by one. There's traditional, behavioral, situation, and technical questions. Traditional questions, um, or the usual suspects, you know, are those questions that you'll likely to get in most interviews. Things like, tell me about yourself, what do you know about our company, um, what are some of your strengths, things like that. These questions are great because you can prepare them. You can find a list of traditional questions and you can have packaged or bottled answers for them. These questions should never catch you unaware. Here's a list of some of the traditional questions that are more common. Your role here is to really understand why they're asking you that question, as with all the other uh, interview questions, but you want to understand what they're getting at so that you can tailor your answer to best answer the question uh, and match the criteria that they're looking for. So I've added some tips into those questions, but there's a lot more uh, that you might get as well. One question that I often get is around how to answer the question about what do you consider one of your weaknesses to be? Um, and the idea here is, is, like I just mentioned, really get a sense for why they're asking you that question. They're asking you that question because they want to evaluate your self-awareness and whether you're open to feedback and growth. Um, so to answer this question tactfully, you want to be honest and find something that shows you understand who you are, um, but also be able to... Um, minimize the impact that that weakness is going to have on a job. Uh, so it shouldn't be anything that has to do with a core element of a job. For example, accounting, you really don't want to say, well, I'm not really good with numbers. <laughs> um, instead, you want to find something that is about you, that you're working on, that you're dealing with, uh, but it's not going to impact, impact the job. So an example that I've used before is, um, well, I'm kind of an interviewer which means that a lot of my thoughts occur in my head. And so when I'm planning, I like to do a lot of different steps in my head. And then when it comes to explain my ideas to somebody, I sometimes kind of jump ahead from step one to step 10. Uh, and so what I need to do is really rewind, slow down and outline my thought process when I'm communicating what's in my head to somebody in the real world. That's how I would answer that question. A few more tips when answering traditional questions. Um, one, I like to use a narrative format. So tell your answers in the form of a story. Uh, stories are what we remember and what we connect with. So when they ask you a question like, tell me about your strengths, you could say, 
well, I've got good communication, good teamwork, and good problem solving. Uh, well, that answer took about five seconds of, of my time and is fairly forgettable. Uh, instead of that, I would want to tell a story and demonstrate um, how I got that or how I used it. I would say, well, one of my strengths is communication because for the last three years I've been working at um, Sportcheck as a customer service associate. Um, so I have really got a chance to meet with a lot of different people coming in with a lot of different needs and sometimes in different emotional states as well. So I got an awesome chance to talk with a lot of people on a day-to-day -day basis and found that I've really developed an ability to um, to tailor my communication style depending on who I'm talking to. So I would definitely say that communication is one of my strengths. And I think that would tie in really well to the job that I'm applying for because X, Y, Z. So that narrative format um, really allows you to bring more depth to your answer and allows the interviewer to see um, uh, a fuller picture of who you are as, uh, as a coworker. An important aspect to note is that a lot of interviewers aren't trained HR professionals, so they may or may not know which questions are illegal uh, as per the Employment Standards Act of BC. Um, the Act says that uh, you shouldn't get any questions pertaining to age, race, ancestry, religion, color, sex, uh, marital status, uh, disability, uh, and so on. Um, however, that, that doesn't stop some employers from asking questions either straightforward or in some of the roundabout ways like listed in the examples. Um, there's really no good way to handle uh, being asked some of these questions. Um, the best advice I've seen is to simply say, um, well, I don't really see how that question pertains to how well I can do the job. Uh, I'd rather talk about how my skills and experience uh, match best with what you're looking for. There's also really no way to fight this um, if, well, there is a way to fight it, but there's no real point in fighting it if you do feel there's an employer who's discriminating, because uh, at the end of the day, if you win the case, really all you would get is uh, an opportunity at a job where it would like you would likely not want to work anyway. Um, so best case scenario is that this you see this as you interviewing them as well, and you feel that they're not a good fit for you. The next set of questions is behavioral questions. These are the most common type of questions that we're hearing about these days. These are also the type of questions that most people dread the most. Um, they often start with, tell me about a time when, or give me an example of, or describe a situation where you, uh, things like that. They work off the premise that past, past behavior is an indicator of future behavior. Uh, and so they're going to try to get you to prove um, when you've used different skills in the past um, with the assumption that if they hired you, you would continue to show the, the same level of uh, performance. Unlike traditional questions, it's really difficult to prepare for these because there's really an endless amount of behavioral questions that you could be asked. Um, so the best way to prepare for these is to come up with scenarios that line up with these three categories tough times, highlights, and working with others. If you can find examples, uh, two to three examples for each of these categories, you can usually tailor the answer to match whichever um, question that you might actually get. So uh, having the same example for showed initiative uh, would uh, be the same situation that you can use for when above and beyond. Um, so prepare by for these by having two or three uh, examples of kind of work, school, volunteering, sports, whatever experience that you have uh, for each of these categories. And then you can tailor your, your answer um, for what they may be looking for. That does mean you need to be thinking about why are they asking you that question so that you can tailor your, your um, your, your answer. The question, uh, tell me about a time where you had to interact with a difficult client. Um, you want to think about why are they asking me that question? Are they asking me that question because they're going to have a lot of different clients and they want to know that I can adapt my communication styles? Uh, or they do they want to know how well I interact with people with different personalities than myself? Um, try to be thinking about why are they asking me that question so you can tailor your answer most appropriately. 
To answer behavioral questions, we're going to use the STAR format. That's what's most common these days. And that stands for Situation, Task, Action, and Result. Responding in the STAR format allows you to create a narrative that allows the interviewer to see how you act in the day-to-day -day, uh, experiences of the job. The R stands for result, so you want to describe what, um, what came of the situation. And we recognize that not every situation can end with a perfect result. So if you need to, you, uh, you tack on the I learned, or this is what I would do differently next time. Uh, for example, the uh, tell me about a time when you had a conflict with a coworker. Uh, a lot of those stories can end poorly because we often get the learning afterwards. So you wanna show your self-awareness and growth um, and, uh, and tell what, what that would be for next time. One question uh, that I'll often get is, uh, how do I answer that question if I actually haven't had a conflict with a coworker yet? Um, and so I would advise you to answer that honestly and say that, yeah, no, I've been fortunate enough not to have a conflict with a coworker. Um, but then go into talking about the steps that you think you've taken that's resulted in you never having a conflict with a coworker. Uh, you can say something like, well, I, I take really uh, careful measures to make really strong relationships with the people I work with because I know that communication and relationship is really the foundation to being able to address conflict early on so that it doesn't get kind of blown up. Here's just a few more tips for how to answer behavioral questions. As I mentioned, always be thinking about why they're asking you uh, that question. Uh, always show openness to feedback and growth. Um, be honest. Um, and, and sometimes it requires balancing initiative and consultation. Um, so they want to know that you can act with initiative when needed, but you're going to check in with supervisors uh, if things are uh, beyond your, your scope. Always be tactful and professional about poor experiences. So really don't bash um, previous workplaces or bosses, uh, especially not in the Kamloops area, uh, as we're a small community and word gets around uh, quicker than expected. Situational questions are trying to gauge your decision making. What would you do in this situation? These questions can really be endless. Um, what would you do if you were faced with a problem you didn't know how to solve or if a coworker disagreed with you, if you caught a coworker breaking the rules? Um, any case scenarios uh, that the employer can come up with? Really, uh, these are similar to behavioral questions in that you, you really can't uh, prepare for them ahead of the time the same way you can traditional questions. Uh, these questions are being asked to gauge your decision making. As I mentioned for the behavioral, it's um, to balance that initiative and consultation. They want to know uh, what kind of head you have on your shoulders. My tip here is always reference policy and procedure. If there's uh, a scenario that you're unsure of how to handle, um, I would start that question with, um, well, the first thing I would do in this situation would be whatever your policy outlines. But because I don't know your policy yet, this is what my judgment would be and then go from there. Some fields have more gray area than others. Um, so it's okay to say that you're, you're really not sure what you would do uh, or that you would seek consultation either before or after whatever the situation would be. Um, you can also show resourcefulness um, and creativity in some of these situations. Again, it's gonna be very job and industry dependent on what type of uh, questions you're going to get uh, for situational questions. Technical questions are very field specific uh, and these are really uh, up to the job that you're applying for. Uh, you prepare best uh, for these by anticipating the questions from the job posting and doing your research. Uh, and so Really, the field's going to dictate what they could be. It could be on computer languages. It could be on psychological diagnoses. Uh, it could be on business management styles. There's so many uh, specific technical questions that you could get relevant to the job you're applying for. So the best thing you can do is know that job posting uh, and research as much as you can. Basically like studying for a test. 
do you have any questions for us? You should always have at least three questions paired ahead of time for the employer. Um, I feel this is a very, very important part of the interview uh, because there's usually a power differential where most of the interviewers every interview is spent with interviewer firing questions down at you. And this is the chance for you to level the playing field and have a conversation with them uh, on the same level. And so you want to really utilize this opportunity to ask really thoughtful questions that will engage the interviewer in a conversation. I see questions being able to go two different routes. You can either follow your curiosity or you can be strategic. Following your curiosity means you're asking questions that shows that you understand the industry, potentially the job, uh, and you want to know the employer's uh, outlook on some of these things as well. And so this can lead to some really interesting conversations. And your job here is to try to engage them in a dialogue of back and forth. Uh, going the strategic route, this is really where you're interviewing them. Uh, as I mentioned, interviews go both ways. And this gives you a chance to look for any red flags around management or the work culture. Uh, here you want to pay attention to any body language or nonverbal cues uh, that they might make when you ask uh, kind of direct questions like this. I would save uh, the obvious questions like when will you be making the decision on the post position to the very, very, very end of the interview. Don't waste um, uh, your questions on something that's going to give you a very kind of um, yes or no uh, or a quick answer. Really save this uh, this time in the interview to further develop that connection with the person interviewing you. Here's a few examples of questions for each train of thought. Uh, really think ahead of what you are curious about uh, for the position that you're applying for, or what do you want to know about the company before you agree to a position with them. One of my favorite questions that I'll always ask is, what would surprise me most about this position? Uh, it's kind of a very, very open-ended question that allows the employer to take the conversation uh, into a direction that may not have come up before in the job posting uh, or through other interview questions. Um, for me, it allows them to kind of, it allows the, the employer to clarify anything that may not be obvious at the out front about the position that you're going into. And it can also lead to some very good discussions. At the end of the interview, thank them for your time. Uh, again, restate your interest in the position and the company. Uh, provide your list of references to them at the end and then shake hands when you leave. Um, if it's in an office, make sure you thank the secretary or receptionist on your way out as well. Uh, don't just run for the door. Following up after the interview uh, is something that's missed uh, a lot. Um, it's not something that's going to decide whether or not you get the job, but it's going to give you a couple bonus points that may sometime may edge you out uh, above the competition a little bit. To do this, just send a thank you note within 24 hours. It can be an email or a written note um, uh, to everybody that interviewed you. Uh, and the idea here is to reiterate your interest and enthusiasm in the company and the position you're applying for. Um, in the note, write a little callback to something discussed in, di in the interview. Don't make it generic. Um, really use this as, as a way to strengthen that connection of the relationship that you started. Um, but it should be short to the point and professional. You don't want to take up too much of their time um, or put any questions in that they might feel obligated to reply to. A couple notes to keep in mind in standing out in an interview. Uh, the first one is to exhibit grit and determination. That means show to the employer that you are uh, determined and resourceful. Whatever it is that they're going to task you with, you're going to be able to uh, overcome it uh, or do your role exceptionally well. The second one is enthusiasm. You're going to show them that you've got a personality that's going to be positive and pleasant to be around. Um, we've all worked with people who could be great at the technical aspects of their job, um, but if they're not pleasant to get along with, uh, then it's difficult to want to keep them around. 
And the last one is cultural fit. Um, we want to show that we're going to be the right fit for the company, for the job, the industry. Um, and uh, again, going back to we're going to fit in with the environment and the people around us. One more I'll say is don't forget to smile. Uh, as I mentioned before, smiling shows people that you like them and they're much more likely to smile back at you, indicating they like you. Um, this goes a long way when they're trying to decide who they like the best in an interview process. And finally, here's a list of the top 10 interview mistakes. Uh, number one, lack of proper preparation. As we saw at the beginning, preparation is really key to set the tone for the interview and ensure that you're going to have a, a good time and good experience and being able to connect with the employers on uh, the information they're looking to know from you. Uh, take a good look at uh, each of the elements here uh, and again, prepare with practicing how you can overcome each of the, the potential hurdles that, uh, that might be presented in these mistakes. And that brings us to the end of this presentation on interviews. Again, I'm Mitch from Career and Experiential Learning. We're here for students and alumni at any time they need to go through career planning, ongoing education, labor market, job application documents, or interview prep. Um, if you liked what you saw here, but you feel you need a little bit more work, come make an appointment with us and we'll uh, go through some of this or give you a mock interview if you need. Uh, typically on campus, you can find us in Old Main 1712. Uh, these days, we can also do virtual interviews through or virtual uh, appointments through Career Connections. Just follow the link uh, on the slide. Thank you and hope you found it useful.